hearing of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, accountability for Russia's war crimes and aggression against Ukraine will come to order. We are here to recommit to re assisting Ukraine during its darkest hour and to honor those who are sacrificing their lives, defending their beloved country from an unprovoked barbaric invasion by Putin and the Russian Federation. We are also here to hold Putin and Russian officials to account. We join the free world in honoring the extraordinary courage and tenacious leadership of President Zelensky. As we all know, Ukraine is the victim of the largest and most lethal attack in Europe <clears throat> since World War II. And the world has been shocked by the massive death and destruction unleashed by Putin. President Putin and others responsible for this ongoing and ever expanding mass murder, war crimes and crimes against humanity must be held to account and prosecuted for their crimes. Indeed, Putin needs to be prosecuted for the crime of aggression against another sovereign nation. Clearly, an aggressive effort to hold Putin personally accountable won't stop the onslaught overnight. We all know this, but it must be part of a comprehensive strategy that includes robust humanitarian aid, robust sanctions, including barring the importation of Russian oil and military assistance in the type, quality, and quantity that empowers Ukrainians to more effectively defend themselves. <clears throat> the Russian military continues, as we know, to use willful, deadly force to target civilians and non-military infrastructure, such as residential buildings, hospitals, schools, and electricity grids, while also targeting humanitarian workers and ambulances, targeting humanitarian corridors, all with heavy artillery missiles or even cluster munitions. Oh, now it is anticipated that Russia will use vacuum bombs or thermobaric weapons if he hasn't done so already. Putin's invaders uh, attacked and seized the great, largest nuclear power plant in all of Europe, which oh, elevates the risk to a whole new level, as does Putin's placing Russian nuclear forces on elevated alert. Deliberate acts to kill civilians, target non-combatant property, and to assault a nuclear power plant constitute war crimes under the 1949 Geneva Conventions. The use of cluster munitions and the potential use of vacuum bombs against non-military targets constitutes a horrific violation of customary international humanitarian law as these weapons use disproportionate, brutal force in an indiscriminate manner. The Kremlin, the Kremlin follows a reckless agenda to reconstitute a Soviet empire with the blood of anyone who stands in their way. I would note parenthetically, I was in Georgia in 2008 just a week after Putin invaded South Ossetia and Abkhazia. And, and, and that, even, that even includes Putin's own people, many of his own soldiers who thought they were on a peace mission, a liberation mission, which begs the question, how then to hold Putin and the Russian Federation government officials to account? As Russia sits on the UN Security Council in the position of permanent member, accountability via UN bodies poses special challenges, given the power to veto possessed by both it and the People's Republic of China. Although the General Assembly passed a resolution under the historic Unity for Peace framework with the US and 140 other members condemning the Russian invasion of Ukraine and calling upon Russian forces to withdraw unconditionally, Putin and his enablers have yet to be held in any way accountable. Putin, including his permanent representative, Vasily Devenzia, have simply ignored the calls of the international community to respect Ukraine, its territorial integrity, and its independence, decisive being a, a clear violation of Article 2, uh, 4 of the UN Charter. And irony upon irony, Russia sits on the UN Human Rights Council, which is also uh, probing this horrific invasion. So again, what mechanisms exist to truly holding the Russian Federation and above all, Vladimir Putin accountable. Can the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, make any difference in response to Russia's absurd allegation that it is Ukraine, not Russia, that is committing genocide, thus a pretext for invasion? Ukraine argued before the court on March 7th that, quote, the Russian Federation shall immediately suspend the military operations commenced on February 24th. Uh, Russia was a no-show. Can the International Criminal Court make any difference? Maybe. 
The lead prosecutor is investigating. Two decades after its finding in 2002, however, the ICC has taken 30 cases out of a potentially thousands and has indicted 44 individuals with only five convictions as of February 2022, though other sources contend that eight or perhaps nine people have been convicted. <clears throat> with 18 judges on the bench and an approved program budget of a, over 154 a million euros for 2022. The court has issued only 36 arrest warrants dating back to the early 2000s, and only seven individuals are in custody. Can an international hybrid tribunal make any difference? Yes, I believe this approach has very real promise. As early as 1998, and even before, I called on, and I wasn't the only one, on the international community to seek justice for crimes committed in the former Yugoslavia, including the horrific killings uh, that occurred in Srebrenica. On several occasions, I visited Serbia, Croatia, and Bosnia, including meetings along with Congressman Frank Wolf in Belgrade with Slobodan Milosevic. We even visited Vukovar shortly before it fell. And everybody will remember the Vukovar III committed heinous acts of barbaric uh, behavior uh, and were held to account, at least some of them. In addition to convening a landmark hearing, I led a concurrent resolution at the time the press for the investigation of criminal culpability and the public indictment of Slobodan Milosevic, the former socialist president of Serbia in Yugoslavia. Such calls by me and so many others led to the formation of an international criminal tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Courts have also been created for the genocide that took place in Rwanda and a special court of Sierra Leone that convicted the first African head of state, Charles Taylor, who never thought he would get a 50 year sentence and he remains incarcerated to this moment. Indeed, we are fortunate to have with us, as one of our witnesses, the founding chief prosecutor for the Sierra Leone Special Court, David Crane, who at great risk to his life and safety, successfully prosecuted people who had committed horrible, horrible, horrible atrocities. And Congress has been active for, in calling for focused ad hoc tribunals. In 19, 2013, I shared a hearing at which David Crane testified that called for the collection of evidence of atrocities committed by Assad and the Syrian government, and that would include Putin, and the creation of a Syrian war crimes tribunal, uh, which also was the subject of a resolution that I introduced that actually passed the House, but we got absolutely nowhere. The Senate never took it up. We could not get the administration to take up the cause either. Indeed, just last year, I shared a hearing on the need for a war crimes and economic crimes court for Liberia. While the UN can provide mechanism for such focus ad hoc tribunals, regional bodies such as the African Union, perhaps even the OSCE, the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, can also play an important role. Such mechanisms need not be UN sponsored. I mean, I'm all for that if it could happen. Uh, but given the positions of Russia and the People's Republic of China on the Security Council, uh, they stand ready to block potentially any effort to do so. David Crane, however, in his testimony, has suggested other viable options, including action by the UN General Assembly. He will testify today that, as he puts it, and I quote him, a second possibility would be the creation of an international tribunal created by the United Nations General Assembly, using this tribunal to restore international peace and security. This would also create an additional hybrid uh, tribunal. They could, as he says, uh, and associated with the Ukraine, ad hoc and hybrid tribunals have been successfully created before by the UN uh, through its Security Council, yet it is not outside of the authority of the General Assembly to do the same. They created the international independent and impartial mechanism for Syria, which now sits in Geneva. Regardless, nothing needs to stand in the way of collecting and preserving evidence. Today, as we've seen, dramatic increases uh, to this hour, 1.3, even more Ukrainians who have fled their homes since the invasion. And that number could go to 5 to 10 million. Nobody knows uh, because they are fleeing uh, massive bloodshed. Countries in the region, including and especially Poland, have been especially welcoming, as we all know, uh, sheltering more than 50% of all those making their way across the border. Yesterday, finally, I introduced HRES 966 a bipartisan resolution with Representative uh, Marcy Kaptur, Wilson, Swazay, Shabbat, and Harris urging the creation of appropriate regional or global 
justice mechanisms to immediately, I say again, immediately investigate and prosecute Putin and those responsible within the Russian Federation for war crimes and the, and the crime of aggression. The time to act for justice and accountability is now. Justice delayed is justice denied. I'd like to now um, yield to my very distinguished colleague, uh, Jim McGovern, for any opening comments that he might have. Um, good morning, and I, I, uh, I joined Co-Chair Smith in welcoming our, our witnesses today. I wanna, I, we appreciate all of your work. Uh, we're here today because on February 24th, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered a full-scale invasion of the sovereign and independent country of Ukraine. The attack is a brazen um, violation of the United Nations prohibition on the use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. It is destroying people's lives and communities as we speak, uh, and I condemn it in the strongest possible terms. As of last Sunday, the Office of the UN uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights reported at least 1,207 civilian casualties, including at least 406 dead, among them children. The figures are likely higher. Yesterday, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees reported that more than 1.7 million refugees have fled in 11 days. This is already a nightmare, a totally unnecessary, unprovoked, and unjust war. But I fear that it may also be just the beginning. We have seen in the past how the Kremlin conducts his wars by attacking civilians. The courageous but now banned Russian human rights organization, Memorial, uh, estimated that there were 50,000 civilian casualties in Russia's 1994 to 1996 war in Chechnya. That's only the first war. The Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Syria documented Russian involvement in war crimes in that country in 2019, specifically the launching of indiscriminate attacks in civilian areas. In Ukraine, hundreds of missiles and artillery, artillery attacks have been launched against cities across the country, including the capital of Kiev. Human Rights Watch has reported the use of cluster munitions. Russian forces bombed Babanyar, a site where Nazis carried out massacres during World War II that is now a Holocaust memorial. The World Health Organization has confirmed the deaths of at least nine people and 16 attacks on healthcare facilities since the invasion started. Russian forces attacked and set uh, on fire Europe's largest nuclear power plant in the middle of the night. There are reports of lists drafted by the Russian government of people in Ukraine who were to be arrested or assassinated. The targets include Russian and Belarusian dissidents, journalists, activists, religious and ethnic, mi ethnic minorities, and LGBTQI plus individuals. All of these actions are potentially war crimes or crimes against humanity, and, and we're not even two weeks in. The consequences don't end with these direct crimes. Because Ukraine is a breadbasket, the invasion may increase food insecurity and hunger the world over. The fear was reflected in the last week's UN General Assembly resolution. There was no accountability for atrocities committed in Chechnya. The ongoing effort to ensure accountability in Syria is painfully slow and is not focused on the Russian role. Ukraine may be different. Let's hope so. Ukrainians themselves are already documenting the damage inflicted on their country. As a videographer told the Washington Post this week, this is about making a record of Russia's crimes. We do believe in The Hague. That's a reference to the International Criminal Court, one of the multilateral human rights bodies that are already acting in response to this war of choice. 39 ICC member states have asked the court to open an investigation and documenting evidence has already begun. Today, as we speak, a hearing is going on in the International Court of Justice, as my colleague mentioned, on Ukraine's petition to order Moscow to suspend military operations. The European Court of Human Rights has urged the Russian government to refrain from the military, from military attacks against civilians and to immediately ensure the safety of medical establishments, personnel, and vehicles. The UN uh, Human Rights Council has already uh, created a new independent international commission of inquiry to investigate all alleged abuses of human rights and international humanitarian law that occur in the context of Russia's aggr aggression against Ukraine, including their root causes. And the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, will create a monitoring and investigative mission in Ukraine to document human rights violations and atrocity crimes occurring due to Russia's invasion. This is an unprecedented response to Russia's rogue aggression 
and human rights crimes. And it gives me some hope. Congress should act quickly to build on these initial mutually complementary steps to advance the accountability. The ICC investigation and the new UN Human Rights Council Commission of Inquiry need financial resources and political support. Congress should support initiatives to document and preserve evidence, official and non-governmental, as has been done with Syria, and the administration should cooperate by sharing relevant intelligence with any jurisdiction that seeks to hold perpetrators accountable, whether international or domestic. We must do all in our power to protect human rights defenders, journalists, and witnesses. And without them, accountability um, is uh, will be impossible. Uh, Congress should make sure that the U.S. support for accountability is centered on fulfilling the rights of victims. Those include the rights to truth and reparations. There is a lot that we can do. Uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we do need to make sure we distinguish between the Russian leaders who are responsible for the carnage and the Russian people uh, who have no say in all of this. Um, let me just say that some, and I'll close with this, some people will argue today that these beginnings are not enough because for jurisdictional reasons, none of the bodies I just mentioned can investigate and prosecute Vladimir Putin's individual responsibility for crimes against, for, crime, for the crime of aggression. And that is true. But the reason is that like the US, neither Russia nor Ukraine is a state party to the ICC. That also means that neither ratified the 2017 amendment that made it possible to prosecute the crime of aggression. So we, we, are, we, are, we are looking for a new option to prosecute Putin's crime of aggression because the countries involved have opted out. In the long run, I believe that this needs to change. And so I thank uh, the uh, chair for getting uh, for this hearing. I thank our witnesses, who I all have great respect for, and I look forward to the further recommendations uh, from them. And I will yield back. Thank you so much, Chair. I'd like to now yield to Sheila Jackson Lee for any comments that she might have. Sheila. Uh, Sheila. Okay, I guess we'll, she'll join us a little bit later. Uh, it is my privilege to introduce our distinguished witnesses for today, uh, beginning with Secretary David Kramer, who has an extraordinarily extensive history of advancing freedom and democracy at home and abroad. Currently, he is the Managing Director of Global Policy at the George W. Bush Institute, where he oversees the Institute's work on human freedom, global health, and women's empowerment. Prior to that, he worked 24 years in Washington, including as Senior Director of Human Rights at the McCain Institute for International Leadership and President of Freedom House from 2010 to 2014. He also worked eight years as the U.S. Department of State at the U.S. Department of State under George W. Bush's administration, including as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, and as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. With his extensive work experience advancing democracy and his expertise uh, in Russia, he authored a book, quote, Back to Containment, Dealing with Putin's Regime, and serves on the board of, as board chairman of the Free Russia Foundation, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization committed to advancing uh, for a free, peaceful Russia. As you will all see later in his testimony, uh, Secretary Kramer brings significant insight on the geopolitics of Russia helping us understand the extensive history of Putin's reckless authoritarian uh, agenda, as well as how to prevent the further suffering of the Ukrainian people. David is no stranger to the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, having testified last May at our hearing on democracy and human rights in Belarus. Also no stranger to our commission is David Crane, a good friend who has testified on multiple occasions, including with regards to war crime tribunals for Syria and Sri Lanka. Indeed, it is a little bit like deja vu all over again, to quote Yogi Berra, as it seems that the same issues that we were discussing in October 2013 in our human rights subcommittee that I chaired with David with respect to accountability for war crimes committed by Bashir and also by Putin, uh, we're back again with horrible, horrible uh, mass murder occurring uh, even as we meet here today. David, of course, brings a tremendous breadth and depth of perspective as the founding chief prosecutor of the International War Crimes Tribunal in West Africa called the Special Court of Sierra Leone. That court established in 2002 was the world's first hybrid international war crimes tribunal 
and also the first global tribunal to hand down convictions for the recruiting and the using of child so soldiers. Most importantly, this judicial body was the first ever to prosecute a sitting African head of state, in this case, Liberian President Charles Taylor, in 2010, uh, 2012. The Special Court of Sierra Leone serves as an example, excellent example, of creating an ad hoc tribunal <clears throat> to prosecute those who bore the greatest responsibility uh, for war crimes and crimes against humanity. Mr. Crane, uh, in his book entitled Every Living Thing, explained in detail his experience seeking justice for victims uh, of atrocity. Then we'll hear from Professor Jane uh, Stromseth, who is the Francis Cabell Brown Professor of International Law at Georgetown University, where she specializes in justice and accountability <clears throat> for atrocity crimes, as well as international human rights. Dr. Stromseth has significant experience working as a public servant, including uh, the deputy to the ambassador at large for global criminal justice as at the U.S. Department of State from 2013 to 2015, and as senior, senior advisor on the rule of law in international humanitarian policy at the U.S. Department of Defense. At the National Security Council, she served as Director of Multilateral Affairs. As an academic on post-conflict justice and the rule of law, uh, as academic on, uh, uh, is building, her written testimony offers insight on how the U.S. can assist in evidence collection of war crimes and potential crime of aggression and how a victim-centered approach is crucial for accountability and prevention uh, of further crimes. I'd like to now ask Secretary Kramer, uh, uh, I yield him such time as he may use uh, for his testimony. Chairman Smith and uh, Chairman McGovern and fellow members of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, thanks so much for convening this critically important hearing today. And thank you for including me along with such distinguished fellow panelists to talk about what is the gravest crisis in Europe since the end of World War II. The way a regime treats its own people is often indicative of how it will act toward other nations. And Vladimir Putin has provided us with a tragic reminder of this through his wholly unprovoked and unjustified invasion of neighboring Ukraine. Amid the worst crackdown on human rights inside Russia since the breakup of the Soviet Union, as Putin moves from authoritarian control to outright dictatorship, he has launched unspeakable acts of aggression in the heart of Europe against the Ukrainian people. Putin's decision to invade Ukraine has already caused massive de devastation and loss of life among Ukrainians. More than 2 million Ukrainians now have already been forced to flee their country, and the United Nations estimates some 10 million could be displaced in the very near future as a result of Putin's attack. We have seen tremendously inspiring leadership from President Volodymyr Zelensky and truly heroic efforts by Ukrainian soldiers and average citizens to resist the marauding Russian forces. But Putin's military is poised for further attacks on major cities, including the capital, Kyiv, through deliberate <laughs> targeting of residential buildings, hospitals, and government complexes, as well as nuclear power plants. This is how Putin conducts urban warfare. See, for example, Grozny and Aleppo. The scenes are excruciating <clears throat> and heart-wrenching to see <clears throat> and watch, excuse me. One need not be a lawyer or an expert on war crimes or crimes against humanity. I'm not, but my two fellow panelists are. To know that Putin and his military, at the risk of getting ahead of due process, of, are guilty of such crimes. I can see the devastation Putin's forces are inflicting on Ukraine with my own two eyes glued to the television screen. I can hear Putin's own words in which he takes full responsibility for what is happening on the ground. All of this being carried out based on his orders. The UN Charter is not the only agreement that Putin has violated. The list includes the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Helsinki Accords, the Charter of Paris, and its updated version signed in 1999. The first time Putin invaded Ukraine in 2014, he tore up the Budapest Memorandum in which Ukrainians agreed to relinquish their nuclear weapons, the third largest force at that time inherited from the break of the Soviet Union. In exchange for that, the United States, Russia, and Britain 
committed to, quote, respect the independence and sovereignty and the existing borders of Ukraine and to, quote, refrain from the threat or use of force against the country. Again, Russia was a signatory to the Budapest Memorandum. Putin has also violated two bilateral treaties with Ukraine. The Russia-Ukraine Friendship Treaty signed in 1997, which recognized the inviolability of existing borders, respect for territorial integrity, and mutual commitment not to harm the security of each other. And the treaty between the Russian Federation and Ukraine on the Russian-Ukrainian state border, which was signed in January 2003 by Putin himself. Putin has a long and bloody record of gross human rights abuses, atrocities, and war crimes, along with violations of other countries' sovereignty and territorial integrity. It started with the way he came to power, overseeing a, broody, a brutal, bloody crackdown in Chechnya in 1999, which tens of thousands were injured and killed, and Grozny, the capital of Chechnya, leveled to the ground. Russia's intervention in Syria in 2015 has included allegations of war crimes there too. Since Putin's first invasion of Ukraine, Ukrainians and Russian controlled parts of, of the country have endured a human rights crisis under the thuggish rule of Russian figures and their proxies in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions and Russian governmental authorities in Crimea. Rule of law had already disappeared for Ukrainian citizens in those areas under Russian control, while persecution of non-ethnic Russians, arbitrary arrests, and unlawful detentions became everyday occurrences. Putin's first invasion of Ukraine, as I mentioned in 2014, came after he pressured pro-Russian President Viktor Yanukovych not to sign agreements with the European Union. NATO had nothing to do with the issue then. That triggered the revolution of dignity. For Putin, the notion that Ukrainians on their own would turn out in the streets at grave risk to demand better from their government, an end to corruption, and a Western orientation was simply too much to stomach. The current crisis centers around Putin's fear and paranoia that a successful democratic Ukraine that looks westward instead of to Moscow could pose a threatening alternative to the kleptocratic authoritarian system Putin oversees in Russia. Putin seeks to establish a Russian sphere of influence in the region, and Ukraine is the biggest piece of that puzzle. Putin sought to destabilize Ukraine so that the West would lose interest in it. He has failed. For all its fits and starts, Ukraine has been moving in a positive direction, deserving of Western support and eventual membership in NATO in the EU. In the lead up to this latest crisis, the Biden administration did an excellent job in coordinating with allies and preparing an unprecedented package of sanctions in the event that Putin invaded. In response to the actual invasion, the international community has responded swiftly through an unprecedented array of sanctions and a significant increase and lethal military assistance to help Ukraine defend itself, as well as a buildup in forces in NATO member states that border Russia and or Ukraine. But more must be done to prevent wide scale casualties and a potential bloodbath. Pursuing war charges of war crimes and crimes against humanity is incredibly important and extremely significant, but it also can take time and we need to move on an accelerated basis. It won't stop the bloodshed happening right this very moment. Today, it is Ukrainians. Tomorrow, it could be Moldovans, Poles, Romanians, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, or Georgians. The list, sadly, goes on and on. The refrain, never again, emerged in the wake of the Holocaust. And Ukrainians are wondering whether that pledge applies to them. Ukrainians are courageously defending their country and their freedom but they need more help from the international community. It is possible that Putin has made a fatal political move in invading Ukraine. His ugly crackdown inside his own country does not reflect the leader confident in his persuasive skills or in support among the Russian people. Regimes like Putin seem stable until they're not. But until his reckoning comes, Putin is wreaking havoc on a country of 43 million people that simply wanted to remain free from Russian domination and free to determine their own future. We can and must do more to help Ukrainians stop Putin's war crimes, crimes against humanity happening right now in that country. We cannot let this stand. Slava Ukraine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for your very eloquent and, and comprehensive remarks and for your decades of leadership. It's deeply appreciated. I'd like to now yield to uh, David Crane, um, uh, again, the man who prosecuted so many of the worst of the worst uh, uh, for his testimony at such time as he may consume. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. And thank you for this opportunity to address this esteemed commission on this critical issue accountability for Russia's alleged war crimes and aggression against Ukraine. I want to thank the co-chairs for their leadership and most importantly, their consistent championing of human rights around the world. Proudly, I've been working with Chairman Chris Smith since 2002 in facing down the beast of impunity. The history of atrocity accountability has been a tenuous one to be sure. Up until the middle of the 20th century, what I call the bloody 20th century, where over 200 million people perished from war and strife, there was little to no accountability. After World War II, the Allied nations gathered together in London to create the world's first tribunal to prosecute those who committed international crimes at Nuremberg and Tokyo. Thus, the cornerstone was laid for what is now modern international criminal law, of which I was a founder. Establishing the tribunals at Nuremberg and Tokyo were the first wave of accountability, and there are three. Afterwards, the world went dark related to atrocity accountability due to the Cold War, yet the flame of justice that was started at Nuremberg burned, not brightly, but it did cast a dim light in the dark corners of the world during that time. When the Soviet Union dissolved in the early 1990s and the world came together under the blue banner of the United Nations, the tragic events in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda saw the international community create two ad hoc tribunals to prosecute those responsible for committing international crimes there. This was followed up with the creation of the world's first hybrid international war crimes tribunal in Sierra Leone. Tyrants, dictators, and thugs, to include heads of state, were no longer able to kill their own citizens with impunity. During this time frame, the world also came together in Rome to create a permanent international criminal court with the hope of prosecuting the gravest of crimes. This was the beginning of the second wave of accountability for atrocity crimes. For the next two decades, mankind took on those who committed war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Three major tribunals for the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone, and somewhat the International Criminal Court, accounted for the deaths of millions, and the perpetrators of those international crimes were put in jail. In the second day, decade of the 21st century, in a gradual and, and really an insidious way, strong men around the world began to seize and maintain long-term power under a populist or nationalistic banner. There are many ways that caused this, and we won't go into it during this hearing. The world began to turn inward. Basic human liberties began to shrink, and the political interest in international atrocity accountability dissipate. We are now in that third wave of accountability, the age of the strong man. The rise of nationalistic tyrants has not been seen like this since the late 1920s and early 1930s. We have literally gone back to the future. One of those strongmen, Vladimir Putin, using the very same geopolitical tactics that another strong man, Adolf Hitler, used in the late 1930s has invaded the sovereign territory of another member state of the United Nations, Ukraine. There is no legal basis for the use of force, and it is clearly aggression and international crime. Additionally, Russian forces, whom Putin commands, have committed war crimes, crimes against humanity, against the brave citizens of the Ukraine, all international crimes. For all this, 
as the president of the Russian Federation and head of its armed forces, Vladimir Putin is individually criminally responsible for the crime of aggression, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. This means the international community can prosecute him for these criminal acts. I did this in West Africa when I took down a sitting president for war crimes and crimes against humanity. Heads of state are no longer immune for their international criminal acts. This is important for all of us to understand now. Heads of state are no longer immune for their international criminal acts. Head of state immunity no longer protects them. We have the experience, the jurisprudence, and the proper rules of procedure and evidence to prosecute those Russians who bear the greatest responsibility for aggression, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, to include Vladimir Putin. How could this be done? Well, first, we have to get the international community through the United Nations General Assembly as noted, as Russia has neutralized the operational effectiveness of the Security Council, it needs to agree on how, how best to hold Vladimir Putin accountable and his henchmen and his senior commanders for international crimes. There are several ways that this could be done. The International Criminal Court has the jurisdiction to prosecute war crimes and crimes against humanity perpetrated by Russia and the Ukraine, in the Ukraine. The prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has already opened a preliminary investigation related to these alleged crimes. A second possibility, and Chairman Smith mentioned this, would be the creation of an international tribunal by the United Nations General Assembly using this tribunal to restore international peace and security. Now, this could be done in two ways. It could be a tribunal that would try all of the alleged international crimes or it would be a tribunal that would be mandated to prosecute the crime of aggression since the International Criminal Court cannot do that. They could also establish an international hybrid tribunal in association with the Ukraine. Ad hoc and hybrid tribunals have been successfully created before by the United Nations through its Security Council, yet it is not outside the authority of the General Assembly to do the same. They created the International Independent and Impartial Mechanism for Syria that now sits in Geneva. As an important aside, a mechanism for the Ukraine is also an appropriate option and consideration. Thirdly, a regional tribunal or court may be created by a consortium of interested states as part of the European Union or NATO. There is an important historical precedent as the international military tribunals at Nuremberg and Tokyo in 1945 were created by a consortium of interested states, allies. A fourth option is using the domestic law of the various member states of the European Union or NATO. Currently, several of those states are prosecuting Syrians who have violated the domestic law of those states based on domestic jurisdictional statutes. This is the least preferred method of accountability, frankly, as this would most likely be a disjointed effort and bring inconsistent legal resorts. Regardless of how the international community decides to do this, it can and it must be done, as Chairman Smith proclaims. All of these options above are legally sustainable and appropriate. These various tribunals or courts, even a mechanism, must be led by a proven and experienced international prosecutor, an experienced deputy prosecutor and registrar. We have those experienced leaders standing by to assist. It must be noted that the United States has led in the creation of all of the international tribunals and courts in the modern era. From Nuremberg and Tokyo, the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, the International Criminal Court and various domestic efforts and mechanisms around the world as well. The United States must continue to show leadership in the creation of justice mechanisms to hold Vladimir Putin and his henchmen accountable. And the Biden administration has really shown this leadership thus far. The world and the American people are united in seeing justice done. This is a unique opportunity. 
However, the world's strong men around the world are watching like crocodiles as to what we do about the international crimes committed by the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. If we do nothing, then we will surely see other aggression perpetrated by China, North Korea, among others. We have to show tyrants around the world that the rule of law is more powerful than the rule of the gun. We cannot go back to the future of the 1930s. Mankind cannot survive otherwise. That concludes my remarks and ask that they be entered into the record. Thank you, sir. Without objection, so ordered. And any extraneous materials, additional materials, any of our witnesses would like to be part of the record, please just submit it to us. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Prosecutor Craig, for that uh, tremendous testimony. Uh, I remember during your period of time when you were prosecuting these crimes uh, in Sierra Leone and in Liberia with Charles Taylor, uh, going back to those years, uh, your safety was put at great risk and you were absolutely undeterred. <laughs> I, I, was, I was in awe of that courage. So I wanna thank you uh, because there were a lot of people in the region where you were who didn't want you doing what you did. Uh, so thank, thank you, thank you so very much. Uh, I'd like to now yield to Dr. Uh, Stromseth uh, for her testimony and please take whatever time you, you think is necessary to deliver your remarks. Thank you very much. And thank you to both co-chairs of this commission for con convening us on these vitally important issues. I'm honored to be a part of this panel. The brave people of Ukraine are enduring horrific atrocities in an unprovoked war of aggression launched by Vladimir Putin. And those responsible need to be held accountable. Indeed, as previous panelists have noted, failure to stand up to those who order and commit such crimes only emboldens their sense of impunity. Putin's past aggressive acts and atrocities in Chechnya, Aleppo, Syria, in parts of Ukraine and elsewhere have only emboldened him. The question now is how the international community will respond and how quickly and effectively. What we need is a strategy of mutually reinforcing accountability. That is accountability through multiple complementary mechanisms grounded in the fundamental principles of international law. These include individual criminal accountability as well as state responsibility, and I'll speak to each. Regarding individual criminal accountability, three mechanisms, in my view, can play especially central roles. First is the International Criminal Court, or ICC. The ICC has jurisdiction over war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide committed on the territory of Ukraine. Ukraine declared its acceptance of the court's jurisdiction eight years ago, following violence in the Maidan protests and following Russia's intervention in Crimea and the Donbass. Furthermore, 39 ICC member states, including 25 NATO nations and 26 European Union member states have referred the situation in the Ukraine to the ICC. Given its jurisdiction and this strong support, the, the ICC is in the best position to investigate and potentially indict and prosecute individuals for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and acts of genocide committed on the territory of Ukraine. And significantly, heads of state and other officials do not enjoy immunity under the court statute. ICC prosecutor Kareem Khan has already commenced an investigation and sent investigators to the region, putting potential perpetrators on notice. There is no statute of limitations for these crimes, so a clear message is being sent to all those who may commit such abuses that justice may one day catch up with them. Admittedly, the U.S. has had a complex relationship with the ICC and is not a member state. But the U.S. has recognized the value of the ICC's work in numerous situations and provided concrete assistance in specific instances determined to be in the U.S. national interest. The situation in Ukraine is just such an instance. The U.S. should explicitly decide to help the court and can be especially useful in providing evidence regarding possible war crimes and crimes against humanity and linking those crimes to specific responsible individuals. 
A second crucial mechanism is the UN Human Rights Council's new commission of inquiry. Last week, the council decided to urgently establish an independent international commission with a mandate to investigate all alleged violations of human rights and violations of international humanitarian law and related crimes in the context of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Standing up this mechanism urgently and effectively is a very important step that warrants strong practical support from the United States. Very tangibly, the US could, for example, provide documentation and evidence of crimes, voluntary funding, diplomatic support, and expertise in the most advanced technological tools possible to sort through massive amounts of information, such as videos, social media, et cetera, to identify relevant evidence and weed out misinformation. The COI should work in a mutually supportive way with the ICC and the huge number of civil society organizations engaged in documentation. The commission can also develop well-informed recommendations on access to justice and that include victim-centered approaches aimed at supporting and empowering those most directly affected by the harms of this horrific war. A third set of mechanisms are national justice proceedings. Prosecutions in national courts can be an important component in international in, in justice for international crimes, building a wider web of accountability that is complementary to international justice. Many European courts can already exercise jurisdiction over atrocity crimes. Ukraine itself has incorporated the crime of aggression and war crimes into its domestic criminal code and established a specialized unit of war crimes prosecutors. The U.S. is helping to build capacity of these prosecutors with funding from the State Department's Office of Global Criminal Justice. In the future, the possibility of proceedings in different national courts provides at least some ability to send a message to those who commit war crimes or crimes against humanity that they can run but they cannot hide and they will enjoy no safe haven abroad. In addition to individual accountability, holding the Russian state accountable for human rights abuses and other violations of international law is another piece of an important, robust accountability strategy. Ukraine has already initiated proceedings before the International Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights, two courts with civil jurisdiction over states. First, in the International Court of Justice, Ukraine outraged by Putin's specious claims of genocide as a pretext for aggression, seeks a ruling that Russia is acting contrary to the object and purpose of the Genocide Convention, and it's seeking urgent provisional measures of protection against Russia. Second, in the European Court of Human Rights, Ukraine is arguing that Russia's actions are violating core rights in the European Convention and the court has already last week ordered interim measures sought by Ukraine, including that Russia refrain from military attacks against civilians and ensure unimpeded access of the civilian population to safe evacuation routes. Proceedings in these courts are ongoing, but they too can be part of a larger web of accountability uh, in light of the array of violations being committed by Putin's Russian regime. There are additional paths for accountability as well. Uh, and building on remarks that my co-panelist um, David Kramer mentioned, supporting civil society actors in Russia by keeping space open for truthful information is a, is a vehicle for potential political accountability. Currently, the ability of the Russian people to gain accurate information about the conflict and to speak out is being thwarted systematically by the Russian authorities. The US and Russia's European neighbors need to do what they can to support a range of efforts to get accurate information about the war into the hands of the Russian people. Truthful information, accurate information about what Putin has unleashed against the courageous people of Ukraine, people that Russians have deep bonds and ties with may ultimately be one of the best prospects for achieving Putin's accountability by his own people. Finally, additional accountability proposals warrant close examination, particularly those that might fill gaps in the jurisdiction of existing institutions. For example, by potentially creating 
an ad hoc hybrid court with Ukrainian consent via an agreement with the UN and approved by the General Assembly. To conclude, the Ukrainian people and their leader, Zelensky, have shown exceptional courage, and they are right that international law is on their side. The US can and must take a leadership role in supporting mutually reinforcing mechanisms to build a robust web of accountability that can give effect to the fundamental principles of international law on which peace and freedom depend. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Doctor, for your testimony and for laying out options so effectively. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I do have a few questions um, uh, I'd like to pose to our extraordinarily distinguished panel. Um, beginning first with if, you know, obviously the special prosecutor for the ICC has embarked on investigations. The Human Rights Council is, is taking it up in terms of a uh, an inquiry. Um, but time is not our friend. It's absolutely not the friend of the Ukrainians uh, as they suffer so much. Uh, could any of you give us a sense of how long uh, before some credible action that gets from investigation to actual um, uh, enforcement, trying to, you know, an indictment, for example, uh, against Putin. Um, you know, more could be added to an indictment as time goes on, obviously, and it probably would. But it seems to me the sooner he, even for his own populace, uh, the, the Russian people, see that he's a war criminal, uh, the sooner it might uh, cause some additional dissension. You know, what, 5,000 people have been uh, arrested uh, in, on the streets of Moscow and elsewhere throughout Russia. Uh, and that, you know, you know what happens when they're put behind bars and they're beaten. Um, they are incredibly strong themselves. Uh, and, and the fact that Putin lied to his own people, uh, I mean, I'm one of those, you know, I've, I've authored four laws on Belarus, for example, the Belarus Democracy Act, Democracy Act of 2004, 2006, 2012, and 2020. Um, I mean, Lukashenko is is a is a puppet of of uh, uh, Putin, but also a horrific abuser of human rights himself. Um, you know, the more the word goes out that Putin is a war criminal, uh, and this time he will not be he will not get away with it. Uh, the better it is for all sides to, especially the Russian people, but the Ukrainians to garner hope from that as well. So that would be my first question. The second would be. Um, you know, uh, the ICC and, you know, I'm all for every modality, every mechanism that will yield uh, a result that's significant and uh, they potentially could do it. And as I said, my opening, the track record has been spotty at best. I talked to uh, people who, um, you know, I have chaired the Africa Global Health Global Human Rights Committee for decades. Um, and now I'm the ranking member with my good friend, uh, Karen Bass, who's the chairwoman. Uh, but the it's been Africa centric uh, for a great deal of time, um, uh, and that's not lost on Kenya and so many other places. Uh, I remember when Boko Haram, obviously a you know a, a terrible terrorist organization, and the ICC you know did an investigation and said maybe three people uh, might be. And I'm not sure whatever happened in terms of the prosecutions. Uh, so that's you know we want it to work. We want everything to work, uh, uh, but uh, my concern is that, you know, if an option really becomes the dominant um, mechanism chosen and it turns out to be um, less than adequate on the intermediate long term, uh, we then fail the Ukrainian people uh, uh, in terms of justice and maybe having a chilling effect on, on Putin's crimes. Um, the idea of having the General Assembly, all of you might want to speak to this, um, you know, do a tribunal, um, you know, the ad hoc uh, initiative as well. Uh, but it seems to be, you know, obviously Russia and others, and there were a number of abstentions to the resolution that did come up at the UN, and you could be sure that Russia would be voting no there as well. Um, but it's not like the Security Council where you got veto power. Um, but again, the ICC, as far as I can tell, could take it up anyway, and some of you might want to speak to that. Um, uh, and uh, I would I appreciate the thought uh, conveyed by uh, Special Prosecutor David Crane uh, that heads of state are not immune. That needs to be, I mean, Milosevic obviously died while he was standing trial, but 
you know, there was a whole war and NATO was involved with that. Of course, we all remember that. Uh, but um, Charles Taylor was taken down while he was head of state. That is, that just shattered the myth that somehow they're immune. So Putin needs to know that. I don't think he believes it. And finally, the idea of, um, of Xi Jinping and, and uh, North Korea and other despots around the world gaining a sense of immunity by inaction or inadequate action. I worry about that uh, even more than inaction because I think there will be action. But the concern is that it will not be um, you know, the world-class prosecution effort. Um, it won't be like the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunals and uh, that obviously netted a great deal of, of uh, just horrible people that committed atrocities. So maybe you could speak to that as well, because, you know, I am, you know, I've chaired 75 hearings on human rights abuses in China. I can't go there anymore. I'm on a hit list, which hit in terms of, you know, they just won't allow me to come there. It's nothing beyond that. Uh, a few other members of Congress are on that. But I, 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 I still can't get it out of my mind that we had an Olympics while Xi Jinping was conducting a genocide. Uh, all of it simultaneous. They could have moved the venue. The IOC was was weak and ineffective uh, on that. And all of us could have done more, I guess. I tried. Others tried. Jim tried. We all tried. But um, it seems to me that, you know, they keep drawing the wrong lesson. And, um, you know, a diplomatic boycott, you know, that, that was a slap on the wrist. So I, I just want to, you know, the whole idea that if we don't get this right, other despots, other dictators elsewhere, uh, including Xi Jinping with his eyes on Taiwan, and maybe elsewhere, uh, could be emboldened and en enabled in, the, in their atrocities. So if you could speak to some of those issues, deeply appreciate it. Well, Chairman Smith, you've certainly given us a smorgasbord of issues. So do we have the rest of the day to speak, sir? No, oh, yeah, as much time as you'd like. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, I apologize for being facetious. I no, mean, these I know, are incredible I know. questions, and these are important questions for all of us to uh, think about today. Though I probably won't address all of them, I do want to to point out as uh, uh, one of five individuals in history to create an international tribunal, the uh, International Hybrid Tribunal in, in Sierra Leone, I think I have a, a unique perspective to answer your first question uh, related to, to speed or effort. You know, it's important that we get this right and not fast. I'm encouraged by the uh, really the focus of the United Nations General Assembly on this issue and other international uh, bodies, that's really important. You know, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, we've been in the age of the strongman for five or six years where really atrocity accountability at the international level has really waned. But all of a sudden, just like in NATO, where NATO has been kind of stepped back, everyone has stepped forward uh, shoulder to shoulder at the at the military level, at the diplomatic level, and at the justice level. So stepping back just a second, taking a deep breath, and understanding this is amazing. This is important. This this has uh, the world has shook off the uh, the malaise that has had related to atrocity accountability, and now is going to step up. So uh, one of the challenges we're going to have is not so much that we can do it, and we can do it, is that there's so much going on so quickly, so fast. There's a lot of lack of coordination and a lot of du duplication. That's okay, but we have to be very, very careful as we move on. The key to a successful tribunal is organization and a valid mandate. So for example, the General Assembly get, uh, get, uh, creates uh, an international tribunal for aggression in Ukraine. That's a great beginning. It doesn't have to start suddenly, immediately, but the fact that it has created the beginning of a tribunal to do this sends an incredible signal around the world. Remember, I warned about those those other those other tyrants, the, those like crocodiles are watching. But if we can get something solidly done, legally supportable, uh, with the support of 140 plus nations saying we must hold him accountable for his aggression, then that's a huge signal. Then, of course, then. The rest of the, uh, the administrative, the logistics, the nomination, and uh, and the appointment of various leaders, uh, that's also critical and important. And that's why I kind of said in my in my open remarks here is that you know we have an incredible stable of long term experienced uh, prosecutors, investigators, registrars that could step in and get this thing going correctly based on their long term experience quickly and effectively. 
and in conjunction with the efforts of the Human Rights Council and, of course, the International Criminal Court. Uh, so it's very, very important for us to kind of think of that. So the bottom line in that comment, and I don't want to hog the time, I do want to just underscore, uh, uh, I'm encouraged, I'm excited. Uh, we should be proud of our international efforts now to get something done. And I really encourage uh, the United States to do what it has done for decades, and I know that the Biden administration will do this, and that is bring the world together, show leadership, let's create a tribunal that has an appropriate mandate uh, supported by the world and working in conjunction with other efforts, as my great long-term friend James Strauss has said, uh, complementing each other. Uh, and let's go put some bad guys in jail, shall we? Um, I, yes, I, Dr. Strumpf said. Yes, thank, thank you. Um, I, I, would, I would like to really emphasize the importance of um, empowering the ICC, which currently has jurisdiction. It has a new prosecutor. It has an overwhelming amount of support from uh, NATO, EU, and other states. It's already in the region starting to do investigations. I, absolutely, these take time. Um, they have to be done fairly, meticulously, but as, as the prosecutor and his team is there, if he's given the support that he needs, um, it can make, I think, a huge difference. And among the ways it can make a difference is the prosecutor is already issuing statements saying um, indiscriminate uh, sh uh, shelling, uh, targeting of civilians. These are war crimes within the jurisdiction of the court. I'm on this. I'm looking at this. I'm investigating this. And while th the fact of these investigations and his presence there may not uh, shape the, the, the conduct of Vladimir Putin, you know, there are others, including forces on the ground, who many of whom were conscripted and told falsehoods about their mission, uh, military leaders in Moscow, commanders in the theater of war, many of them possibly may decide they're unwilling to risk war crimes prosecutions in connection with Putin's disastrous war. So I think it's really important to get um, support and the, these statements out because it's not only about accountability after the fact, it's trying to prevent more atrocities in the moment and to do whatever can be done in that regard. And another reason I stress the importance of the Commission of Inquiry is that there is a huge amount of information, so many organizations gathering documentation. And in, in order to sort of filter through all that and get to the core of what can establish uh, crimes and responsibility linkage to particular individuals, there needs to be a real effort uh, to coordinate and streamline that. And I think in all of those ways, the U.S. can be enormously important. This stuff is up and running now, and, and I think we need to do every with everything we can to support it. And Mr. Chairman, if I may, just to add uh, uh, to what my fellow panelists have said, Putin has felt for a long time that he is immune to any international criticism or domestic accountability. It's, as I mentioned in my testimony, it started when he came to power through his obliteration of Grozny and Chechens in 1999 and 2000, and has continued since. And we've seen what he's done in Syria, where uh, very strong allegations of war crimes have been leveled against Russian forces there. Already, he has been turned into a pariah as a result of being sanctioned himself by the international community. And that sends an incredibly important signal. But to reinforce what my colleagues have said, an indictment of him through some international tribunal process would not only uh, make him a further pariah, if that's possible, but send a signal to all of Russia that their leader is viewed this way by the international community. It's not just the West, it's not just the United States, it's not NATO, it's not the European Union. It is an international delegitimization, if you will, of Vladimir Putin. And also, if we can get word of that to the Russian forces in Ukraine, that they are there fighting on behalf of a leader who has been indicted for war crimes and crimes against humanity, that could certainly put an end to their interest in being sent out as as fodder uh, for Putin's whims. And, and by the way, I would also go after Lukashenko as well, uh, because Lukashenko has been supportive of him. Belarus is one of five countries, along with Eritrea, Syria, and North Korea, and Russia, of course, uh, that voted against the General Assembly resolution last week 
and, and Lukashenko should be in the dock right next to him. My apologies. No, got it. Very good. Thank you. Just tell me, me David, I didn't mean to jump in on you there, but you're making okay. some incredible points related to a head of states uh, who, uh, up until uh, Charles Taylor, uh, actually did operate with impunity uh, based on the, uh, the quirkiness of a centuries-old head of state immunity concept, which still is valid, but not so much for uh, international crimes. You know, we, uh, we kind of think, well, can, can a head of state ever actually be uh, concerned about that? Well, you know, Charles Taylor, just 10 years ago, never thought he would ever be held accountable for war crimes and crimes against humanity, the very same crimes that Vladimir Putin is committing. And now he sits in a uh, Her Majesty's maximum security prison in the United Kingdom for largely the rest of his life. So I, I agree with you, David, that this is really important that, uh, uh, that we send that signal. The creation of, uh, and already the development of uh, investigations against him sends an important signal but as soon as an important body like the International Criminal Court announces that it is formally investigating and doing these things, as well as the General Assembly, the United Nations stepping forward with another court or tribunal related to aggression uh, and uh, moving forward with a potential indictment uh, over time, this has to be done carefully, uh, that's going to send a huge signal. And yes, uh, I agree with uh, Jane Stromseth. We've got to send signals. We've got to send message messages across the board uh, that this just won't be tolerated and that we're going to take action. It's important for our listeners to understand is there's no statute of limitations on this stuff. So, you know, we're still prosecuting camp guards uh, from World War II at uh, concentration camps. So uh, once we uh, once we uh, bite down on Putin and his henchmen, uh, you know, they are forever war criminals uh, and uh, they will be held accountable someday whenever that political moment happens that the world decides uh, to hand him over. Can I, one just very brief question. Uh, who decides uh, we want complementary efforts to, you know, whatever the best mechanism is, that's what everyone coalesces behind. Uh, <clears throat> but there could be competition. You know, the ICC might also want to finally prove itself, to, uh, you know, going forward. Uh, and that would be a good thing, I would think. But uh, uh, the General Assembly idea, which I think would, would you know, Maybe that could be stood up faster and more effectively. Uh, but who actually decides this, uh, in your opinion, uh, so that we don't have competing uh, interests and that leads to delay and delay is denial. The sooner this gets done in a comprehensive and, and totally professional way, the better it is for the Ukrainians and the Russians. Any idea who decides yeah, it? Well, the, the ICC already has jurisdiction. Oh, I know that. It's, I yeah, know that you're... it's already investigating. And probably given the, the documentation and the evidence uh, of war crimes uh, is, is probably in the position to most quickly and rapidly, you know, consistent with due process and careful, careful and impartial work, um, be able to issue uh, an indictment and arrest warrant. Uh, another tribunal would, you know, set, putting that, uh, establishing that takes time. You have to get the judges, you know, all of that. So I, I think if what we're trying to do is have some immediate um, action that could delegitimize Putin in the way that um, the my other co-panelists described, I think the ICC with, with, with support is in the best position to do that expeditiously. Do the other two witnesses uh, agree with that? Okay, Secretary Kramer. Uh. I certainly concur with uh, uh, Jane, and, and and the ICC is up and running and moving forward, and we can and we can send those important signals. But we've got this terrible crime of aggression, which is just hanging out there. It's a four hundred pound gorilla in the room. Uh, we can create an ability to hold him accountable for that, uh, in conjunction with what the, the ICC uh, is doing as well. Uh, and you know, I, I don't see a. A, uh, a problem with a simultaneous uh, investigations related to that. It's a function of, of uh, leadership and management. It's a, a function of working together, uh, the two tribunals working together to do this. Uh, but I, I kind of tend to agree with Jane related to the ICC who can get something quickly uh, out there as far as at least to the point where the Russian people know that they are now being uh, led by a, uh, uh, an indicted war criminal, which is incredibly effective against Charles Taylor. He lost all power as soon as I put the hammer down. And just as an aside, just something that we did uh, intentionally to even delegitimize him even further, we got the uh, 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 Interpol 
to issue a red notice for Charles Taylor for all member states to arrest him if he's in their jurisdiction. That had huge political ramifications all over the world because a lot of people uh, know about red notices and they think, wow, this guy really must be bad if they issued a red notice. Maybe I'm doing a little tongue in cheek, but there's nothing wrong with uh, with sending signals. And that might be one that uh, Interpol maybe want to consider is is doing just that issue a red notice for his arrest and hand over to an appropriate justice mechanism. Thank you. Uh, Co-chair McGovern. Well, thank you. And let me again, let me thank the witnesses. Um, this has been a, a, a fascinating uh, hearing. And, and let me let me just say, I, I think um, I think there's there's great consensus here that uh, <laughs> that uh, what is happening is horrific uh, and that those responsible need to be held accountable. Uh, and um, and I think and I, I want to thank uh, Coach Chair Smith for holding this hearing, because I think even just having this hearing, um, I think sends a signal that, in fact, um, you know, there is a consensus to hold people who are responsible for these terrible crimes accountable. I think that that in and of itself is important. Uh, it's not just for Putin. It's for the people around Putin. Um, you know, it's 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 for the victims uh, of this atrocity that they're not going to be forgotten. Um, and, um, you know, and that uh, and that there are people all around the world uh, that uh, that believe in accountability. And, um, you know, and, and I think as, as as we speak, there are there are already five mechanisms that are already um, looking into this stuff. Um, uh, three of them, I think the ICC, the ICJ, and the European Court of Human Rights are already collecting evidence. Um, and, I, and I think, as I said in my opening statement, I think we ought to do everything we can to support them, to be wind at their back, uh, to make sure they have what they need. Uh, and that includes in, in, in terms of, of, of resources. Should there be an, an independent another mechanism? I mean, I'm I'm not. I think that 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 possibly yeah, that may be a good idea. So long as it is a, a mechanism that um, you know is is viewed as you know as, as something that has international support. Um, because I you know as I'm we're ha we're having this this hearing today, I I can't help but think that uh, you know uh, that there'll be another Putin in the future. Um, and we've had Putins in the past, right? And I don't think we can, we should approach this as every time we, we, we see a situation like this, we got to come up with a new individual, uh, unique mechanism to respond to it. We're in a, a unique situation now. We're not state party to the ICC. I mean, we have our, you know, we, 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 we've kind of limited our toolbox, you know, maybe again, uh, what Chairman Smith and, and others have suggested, maybe we do need to work with the UN General Assembly, see whether there's something, um, you know, additional that we can put in play. But there are mechanisms that are that we need to support that I think, um, you know, can get results. I'd also say that this is hard, right? Um, hard stuff. Um, you know, if, if you, you know, uh, setting up any kind of a new mechanism, um, you know, has to include how you gather evidence, how you protect evidence, how you protect witnesses, um, you know, how you gather the testimonies of victims, you know, where do reparations fit into this? What, you know, you know, how are people held accountable? Um, you know, all those things you have to be thought of when you do anything, right? And, um, you know, and so I, um, so, I, you know, I, I'm not sure, I mean, I'll, I'll let, if people have additional things they want to add, I, I, I will yield to you. But um, but I think we are all together uh, in this in, in believing that what is happening right now, not just the crime of aggression, but crimes against humanity, uh, you know, war crimes, um, all these things uh, need to be held. Um, we need to hold those responsible. Uh, to to account, and it, again, it's not just Putin. Um, and so, if if people are watching this hearing, understand that um, people are not going to look the other way, um, and that hopefully that is an incentive for them to try to persuade Putin to take an off ramp. Because the longer this goes on, and the more crimes that occur, the more culpability uh, that people are going to have in the state 
uh, and in the Russian military. Um, and I don't think the world's going to look the other way. Um, you know, I, I could talk about, again, kind of our inconsistency in holding, uh, you know, brutal leaders um, accountable. Um, uh, and I think it's really important that, um, again, whatever we do doesn't look like the United States has decided, you know, you know you're our adversary and therefore we're going after you. I mean, we, we, we have had people we have, have had alliances with, quite frankly, uh, who need to be held accountable. And I'm thinking right now of uh, MBS in Saudi Arabia, and yet, you know, they're not. But for the sake of this hearing today, we are all united um, in our outrage over what Putin is doing. And, um, and, and, you know, and we are committed to accountability. And I think we have to have the all of the above approach. Um, I think, uh, you know, um, Professor uh, Shramseth said that, uh, Mr. Crane said that. I agree with David Kramer, too, when he said, look, we, we, have, we have to get this right. Not, I, I think I'm, I hope I'm not misquoting you. We have to get this right and not fast. That we got to we have to make sure that this that if, that when we do this that we do it in a way that has international credibility and that it sticks uh, and that there's a real consequence because that's the way to prevent these kinds of things from happening again. But let me just just say to the panelists, I mean, if there's any other point that you want to make that we haven't addressed, you know, I'll I'll give you this opportunity to speak. But I really I you know I mean we have hearings where people have very vastly different approaches to things. I think everybody's kind of in the same, you know, ballpark here, um, and um, uh, and I think the again the, the challenge for us is to make sure that we're supporting, even if we decide to add an additional mechanism, that we support existing mechanisms that are already doing some of the important work that needs to be done. But let me open this up. I don't know whether Mr. Kramer you, or uh, Professor uh, Strom, Seth, or Mr. Crane, that anything I you want to add that um, that we haven't already covered. I, thank you so much, uh, Representative McGovern, for your thoughtful sort of synopsis of the of the discussion so far. And I, I think you're right that there's a huge agreement in the need for mutually reinforcing um, accountability mechanisms of different different kinds that can can each play their part. Um, and you mentioned in particular the the need to attend to the needs of victims. Uh, and I, I just would like to say a few words on that. I mean the. The, the pain and the trauma and the harm that's being visited upon the people of Ukraine, including young children and mothers, uh, you know, in this in this conflict is just uh, scarring and deeply, deeply um, harmful. And I think in any of these approaches, particularly in gathering testimony, um, it's so important to do it in a trauma informed way to support and in humanitarian and other ways, those who've been affected and to empower those who've been affected. I think often victims um, for the, and, and find out what, what justice means to them, right? Because often um, empowering victims and helping them be in a position to be change agents and advocate for justice uh, going forward can be a very big part of the, the the healing process, a very important part of justice. So I think all of those elements should also be attended to in this uh, in, in these efforts. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, thank you for your important remarks uh, related to uh, uh, how hard this is. Yes, it's hard, but it's something that has to be done. Uh, but we can do it uh, as we enter into March Madness and we're thinking of basketball. Uh, we got a deep bench. We've got a lot of experience out there in the international com community to include the United States who can take this ball and run with it. And I think that that should be heartening uh, to both uh, the United States as well as the international community that we can do this. We've been there and done it before. We've got the experience, the jurisprudence and the, the appropriate rules of procedure and evidence uh, to take this on uh, appropriately uh, and under law. And it has to be seen to be something under law. I want to point out something that Jane brings up and that you did too, uh, uh, Chairman McGovern, and that is it is about the victims. It's always about the victims. It's foreign about the victims. And Jane has heard me say this many, many times. And we were in West Africa. We watched the, we walked the countryside listening to the victims tell us what we should be concerned about because a kind of thing I've kind of coined uh, back when I was there is the justice we seek 
the justice they want. And there's different approaches to justice. So again, humility uh, needs to be inserted into this process and understanding what the victims are going through. My God, we go, we watch this on CNN hourly and it's painful to watch. But you know what this does to me? As it did in West Africa, it builds a righteous fury that under law, we can take these people down and hold them accountable. And we can. Mr. Kramer, I don't know if you have any last words you want to um, say, but uh, let me also point out for the record, I, I want to, again, since we're speaking about uh, Russia right now, I want to thank you for, I don't know, we go back a long time with, with your incredible work on um, helping us uh, move the Magnitsky law uh, into being. And, um, and I think that's another tool of accountability uh, that, um, that I think we can, you know, that we can utilize uh, as well. Uh, but uh, I want to thank you for your work as well. Well, Chairman McGovern, thank you. I appreciate that very much. And, and you and Chairman Smith have just been uh, unrelenting stalwarts on, on these issues throughout your careers. And so a huge salute to both of you, um, including for holding this hearing. I think you're absolutely right uh, that, that having this hearing is very important. It sends signals. Signals are critically important because if leaders think they can get away with these egregious abuses of power, war crimes even, then we will see this repeated elsewhere. And so it's critically important to show that there will be accountability for these kinds of actions, for this kind of behavior. Otherwise, Putin will think he can keep going and go further beyond Ukraine. Uh, otherwise, she will think he can go into Taiwan with impunity. Uh, and we will see other leaders think the same. Holding our leaders accountable is part of a democratic system of government. And when other countries are not uh, following a democratic system of government, democracies have to unite to hold those leaders accountable for the abuses they engage in. So I, I agree, Mr. Chairman, this is a time for unity. It's a time for solidarity with the people of Ukraine who did absolutely nothing to deserve the pain and horror that is being inflicted on them by Mr. Putin. He is responsible for this. And if we do hold Putin accountable, as I said earlier, Russian forces who carry out his orders might think twice before doing so. Chinese authorities might think twice before carrying out Xi's orders or anywhere else. And so I think this, this is critically important signal to send. So thank you for having this hearing. And I, I thank all three of you for your excellent testimony. And uh, I thank Co-Chair Smith for putting this hearing together in such a timely fashion and uh, appreciate his leadership. And I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Jim, and uh, thank you for your questions and leadership uh, as well. And it's, uh, I'd like to now yield. We've been joined by Steve Cohen, um, and I yield to him. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I, I I just been juggling three balls. I've got uh, three other two other committees, and and I apologize. I got in late, and I hate to ask any redundant questions. Most of what this I think is about is about holding Putin responsible for the humanitarian crisis, the, the war crimes, et cetera, and we need to do that. Uh, I don't know that he'll, I guess jurisdiction is the major issue. You probably discussed that, but does he have to come to the, 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 the tribunal to, to be subject to jurisdiction or how does that work? Mr. Crane, you smile, you might have an answer. <laughs> well, it is all about jurisdiction. We just can't pick somebody up off the street and, and try him for, we don't have any authority to do so. Uh, but we do have a international criminal court that does have the jurisdiction authority uh, to, uh, uh, to prosecute him uh, for war crimes and crimes against humanity. And uh, during the hearing, we had a great discussion about uh, other methods of which we can hold him accountable to include potentially uh, another tribunal to hold him for the crime of aggression, which would have the ju jurisdiction to try him for that. I don't want to go into a law lecture, uh, but it is about jurisdiction. You can't try somebody just because you're mad at them. You have to have that jurisdiction. Well, it's good to hear that there's jurisdiction without him having to personally uh, acquiesce to it or appear. Uh, I thank each of you for your interest. I will support your work. Uh, and, and Representative Smith has been my friend, and he's a great crusader for human rights. And I, I appreciate him holding this hearing in, in memory. And I, I'm here partly just for the memory of Tom Lantos, who was such a wonderful man, and I've revered his the time I had to serve with him, although brief. So um, I don't know what you think, except I've been watching CNN so much. And it, it's, it just brings tears to your eyes every day to see the people, and, and that's not going to stop children, children being dying and being injured, and older people, et cetera. It's just, it's he is a cruel, heartless son of a bitch. 
I yield thank back you. the balance of my time. Steve, thank you so very much. And I, too, share, as I know, Jim McGovern, all of us, uh, that great respect and admiration for Tom Lantos. Thank you for your leadership on the OSCE, the Helsinki Commission. Um, deeply appreciate that. And uh, I do, uh, I think, uh, is Andy Harrison? He was jumping on a moment ago. I'm not sure if he's let me look. I don't see him. Um, while we're waiting for him, if you don't mind, then I think Sheila Jackson Lee will be jumping on as well. Um, Maybe the panelists briefly could speak again to the issue of how fast, uh, without compromising the quality of, of the investigation. I mean, additional data and, and information could be added to such an investigation. I mean, what's the the minimal without being in any way shoddy um, uh, in terms of the investigation? Because time is, you know, fast, but but quality quality is important. Uh, because again, I think this could have a a profound effect. Uh, on the Russians, um, it could have a profound effect on the Ukrainians uh, and even Russian troops who uh, may be loath to follow a, an indicted war criminal, uh, knowing that their complicity, however ordered uh, by their higher ups, uh, makes life even more difficult. And in and, and the officer corps, it could have an impact. It could have an impact on Lukashenko, especially if he gets indicted at some point as well. Uh, so I, I just raised that to how fast, because uh, I don't think time is our friend. Uh, we all know that. I watch, like uh, Steve just said, uh, the heartbreaking pictures uh, every single day. Um, uh, I mean, people carrying their little children who are dead or wounded, um, the tears as they tell their stories. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the idea of being just so thorough and then when it's all over, we indict. Uh, let's do it now without, again, compromising that. And secondly, uh, didn't any of you think, I thought it was delusional on the part of the Russians to bring an ICJ action alleging that there was a, I mean, this just may be their mindset of how delusional this all is, uh, that they thought they could get away in the IJC, ICJ, I mean, uh, uh, an argument uh, that somehow it's the Ukrainians committing genocide. I mean, and then they don't even show up on the 7th of March, uh, you know, for their, um, for their action that they have brought. I mean, that is absurd and, and you might want to speak to that briefly as well you know chairman smith time is important i get the point time is essential but uh time is not a factor in a lawful process that we hold individuals accountable for any crime but to include international crime i can only use my example i was appointed uh, by kofi annan in, uh, in april of 2002 and 11 months later, we uh, executed Operation Justice. I had signed the indictments and we arrested all the parties to all of the conflict in West Africa in 55 minutes in an operation called Operation Justice. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a fairly effective, quick uh, move. Uh, but, you know, this can be done in, in two parts. We have the International Criminal Court. We have a focused international prosecutor that is going to do what is appropriate under law and his procedures to do what he can. So that's happening. That will happen. The COI has stood up. Uh, the Human Rights Council will move forward with uh, the work that they're doing. And then followed by behind that would be some type of mechanism related to the crime of aggression. Uh, you know, I, I can't give you time. I wish I could. You know me better than that. Uh, but the bottom line is this, could, this will happen appropriately and as quickly as law and procedure allows us to do this. Because when you're at the international level, you can't make a mistake. You don't want to sit there and blow this and all of a sudden have an appellate court throw the thing out because we blew a rule of procedure or a rule of law because we're, we're doing this too quickly. Uh, so again, does, does that also apply to the uh, international tribunal that the General Assembly might uh, create for the crime of aggression as well? Well, yes, it does. I mean, any 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 justice mechanism has rules and procedure uh, uh, and jurisprudence, which require it to do uh, what it's supposed to do to ensure a fair and open trial. Uh, and that'll be done. Uh, you know, I'm actually, uh, uh, again, encouraged. Uh, we do have a, a, a very strong experience in this area. It will be done as quickly as appropriately. Uh, but we need to respectfully, sir. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'd like to get this going and we probably will. Uh, but let's kind of drop the equation of time on this only because I think we will get it right. It will get it done and he will put it, be put in jail someday. Anybody else? Oh. I, on your question, your very good question about um, Russia's specious claims of genocide. 
Um, I think international law and the, particularly the Genocide Convention, which reflects just the horrific experience of the Holocaust and the need to uh, hold people accountable and to make it an obligation of states' parties to um, extradite or prosecute those who commit genocide. Um, it's particularly hurtful, given, given the devastating experience of those who've suffered genocide, to have false claims, misleading claims, um, specious claims being made by a country as a, as a pretext for aggression, you know, using concepts in international law for exactly the opposite purpose for which they're intended. Um, and I think it's really important that Ukraine has taken Russia to task, has brought this case to say this is a misinterpretation, this is an abuse of the object and purpose of the Genocide Convention, and that there needs to be um, a, a judgment on that uh, to, to, to really underscore uh, that these are principles of international law that need to be respected, not abused and misled and contorted. Thank you. And, and Mr. Chairman, if I may just add, uh, I, I know this hearing is focused on holding Putin accountable through international criminal processes, but of course, this is not the only tool or mechanism we have to try to stop this horrible war. Uh, the administration and the international community, I think, have done an excellent job with sanctions. You, we can have debates about further sanctions on the energy sector, for example. Um, we also have been doing a very good job, although more needs to be done in helping Ukraine defend itself. Uh, that is arguably the best way to bring this conflict to an end so that the Russians understand the costs of continuing their unprovoked aggression against Ukrainians, uh, beefing up the military defense capabilities of our NATO allies in the region. Um, it has to be part of a, of a ho holistic approach, if you will. Um, and I think together we can and, and will be able to prevail. But in the meantime, as we all have acknowledged, Ukrainians are, are being injured and killed uh, every single minute, every single day. And we have to figure out a way to stop that. Okay. Um, let's see if he's not here, right? Okay. Uh, again, I, if there's anything else, any of our distinguished witnesses would like to add, I can't thank you enough for your, your leadership over multiple years. Uh, it's inspiring uh, sharing that those insights and that counsel uh, with the Lantos Commission it certainly will be helpful. We will widely disseminate this to members uh, and to the administration. As I indicated, C-SPAN is going to broadcast this not once, but I'm sure several times. So we're grateful for that. Um, so that an even larger audience of Americans will get to hear from you. Um, and so I can't thank you enough for your leadership. And uh, uh, Jim, do you have anything else for you, that you wanted to add uh, before we close? If not, I the Mr. hearing Chairman, is Oh yes. Let, let me oh. ask. What, let me ask a question. And I don't know nobody. Thank you, sir. Nobody here is from the UN, but does the UN have the power to send uh, folks in to monitor the humanitarian corridors, and and try, maybe that would have some effect on Russia, knowing that there was an independent group that was uh, observing and possibly enforcing the humanitarian corridor. You know, it's interesting. The operative arm of the UN is the UN Security Council, which would argue Forget it. such. <laughs> and since Russia is a permanent member of the Security Council, you know where this is going, sir. Yes, sir. That's true. But That's I, I should add that um, with the consent of the host state, Ukraine, um, there's a lot that UN, the UN can do in sending humanitarian workers and, of course. and so forth. So uh, to your question, I think, in fact, there there is the ability of the UN um, to to do some of the steps measures on the humanitarian side that you're that you're suggesting. Thank you, doctor. That would be important. And if we could, I don't know how we get the UN to move on that, but if they look at it, we address our ambassador. Uh, the, the question, you know, the chairman asked about uh, um, Russia using Jurisdiction, the, you know, issues to say, claiming that, that Ukraine was violating, it was genocidal or whatever. I mean, one thing we've learned and we should have known forever and we forgot for a while. I mean, I went to Russia once with Dana Rohrbacher and I love Dana, but uh, um, we, we got lulled into thinking that Russia was almost semi-normal. They are, he is, a, he is not Russia, but Putin is an inveterate liar. And, uh, and he lies about de 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 denazification. 
with with uh, the president having uh, Jewish history and Jewish religion, and uh, the denazification is nothing but something to defend his actions to the Ru with the Russian people. He could have said, you know, trying to defeat the dinosaurs wouldn't have made any difference. He, there's no truth whatsoever, and we can never trust them at all or trust him. Shouldn't be the, the Russian people were okay when I was over there. Uh, not as good as Dana made them out to be, but they were okay. <laughs> Yield back. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, with no further comments, uh, again, we've introduced uh, a group of us, um, HRES 966, um, and it, it seeks to get the House on record uh, for these initiatives. It doesn't say that the ICC is the best way. We just want the best way. And I want to thank all of you again for your, your tremendous contributions to humanity uh, and to justice. The hearing is adjourned. Thank you.